Hello, you're watching Studio Ken. Make sure you don't miss any episode of Studio Ken by subscribing to the YouTube channel. To subscribe, search for Studio Ken on YouTube, click subscribe on the bottom right of your screen and set a reminder. You can also watch Studio Ken on Diamond TV on Wednesday at 18.30 and on Saturday at 19 hours. Studio Ken, the home of Kennedy Gondway on YouTube. One sure thing about human life is that it does and will come to an end. No matter how short or long one's life may be, the end is sure to come. Some lives end abruptly, others are more drawn out, but death is sure for us all. Yet, much as we know the certainty of death, it is one thing that most of us generally choose to not talk about. End of life is a very uncomfortable topic for families and even healthcare professionals. And in our Zambian culture, people widely think that talking about death is actually inviting it. How then do doctors and nurses who interface with terminally ill patients and often give the prognosis of death when they have done all they medically and scientifically know, handle telling a patient that death is certain? Are they trained and adequately prepared to handle such communication? On Studio Ken today, I'm speaking with a doctor who has dedicated his professional life to helping patients and their loved ones prepare for an end of life in a manner that adds more life to their days so that their end is not filled with anxiety, stress, or depression. Dr. Mata Moses Mata is a palliative care worker and advocate. Super fantastic and delicious. Fire and the wire, baby, the beef flow. Your desire taking you higher and higher. My name is baby, 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 flow. You're now rocking with Studio Ken. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Chances are. Dr. Mata, welcome to Studio Ken. Thanks for having me, Ken. First of all, what is palliative care and how does it differ from conventional or hospital care? So that's a, an interesting question. A little bit difficult. So palliative care is it's just an approach to care that takes people living with conditions that can be considered terminal. They'll eventually take their life and we follow these people right from the point of diagnosis. We follow them all the way and are taking care of them up to the point they die and even beyond. So when you talk about conventional care, conventional care is actually part of palliative care, but palliative care is a more holistic approach to taking care of people with these chronic uh, terminal conditions. So in simpler terms, palliative care involves people like yourself yep. giving hope to someone who's been told this ailment you've got is incurable and the only thing is death. Absolutely. Hope is a big part of what we do. How easy is it for you to give hope to someone who's been told you, you're dying? It's, it's not always easy, but it's important. And it's really about defining what, what we mean when we say hope. Right? At the beginning of an illness, it's you're hoping to recover from it. You're hoping to walk out of that hospital bed and go back home. But what about at the end, when you are approaching the end of life? What does hope look like? How do you define hope? Maybe hope becomes, I just want to be free of pain. Hope becomes, I want to reconcile my relationships with my, my family members. Maybe they're family members we haven't spoken in a very long time and I, I, I don't want to die without having sorted those issues out. Maybe hope at that point becomes preparing yourself, if you're a spiritual person, preparing yourself for what you believe comes next. So it's really about how do you define hope. And there's always hope, no matter how or at what point you are in your illness. What is a general reaction from people that have been told the only way out is for you to die? <laughs> it varies. Um, there have been situations where People know, generally, a lot of the times, especially if someone has been unwell for some time, uh, they know that the, the end result is not going to be recovery. 
So those ones are sometimes easier, but not not easy, but maybe a little bit easier. And then there are, there are people who just, no one would want to be told it, that you're going to die. So it can be quite devastating for the, for the patient, it can be devastating for the family as well. So we have um, extremes where people kind of accept it quite early and then others fight with it and they struggle with it all the way until they, they pass away. How do you break the news? It's a process. Um, it's not just showing up at a bedside and saying, oh, by the way, you have so many months to live. It's not like in the movies. It's, first of all, for us, we have to make sure that we have all the information that we need. It starts with making a, a proper diagnosis. And then it's about making sure we've done everything medically that we can potentially do. And then it's sitting down with the family to find out what they know and explaining and answering their questions. And then it's essentially it's saying we'll, we'll, we've done everything that we can medically in terms of looking for a cure that will take this away from you. But that's not going to happen. But there are still things that we can do. So it's never as simple as saying, oh, you're going to die. It's, it's, we, we don't word it like that um, because that would just cut the conversation right there. What is the general reaction from people, family members? It's sadness, it's uh, anger, uh, frustration with, with us, it's unbelief. It's, it's, a, it's a whole spectrum of, of reactions. Um, so we've had situations where people say, I hear what you're saying, but I don't believe you. And I'm going to seek a second and a third and a fourth and a 17th opinion. And uh, that is allowed? It's absolutely allowed. It's the right of every, every patient, every family member to, to seek opinions. Uh, much as it's allowed, um, there are situations where we lose time because we're working with time, right? And you want people to focus on quality of life. So there have been sad situations where people are going from hospital to hospital to hospital, traveling out of the country, using a lot of resources, and, and that is a burden financially for the family. They're losing time that they could have possibly be spent um, preparing. So it's a right, yes, but it's, it's something that should be used with, with caution. You are a Christian yourself. Yes. And the Christian faith teaches us believers, all believers, that nothing is impossible with God. But at the same time, you are a doctor. How do you marry these two worlds? Because in one part of you, you need to tell people that um, um, this is the end of you. But at the same time, you are a Christian. I've heard of situations, for instance, where people stop taking life-prolonging drugs because their pastors have told them, God will heal you. And indeed, God does heal. Yeah. So that is an important conversation that we have. And that's where, when you talk about palliative care, it's not something that one person can do. I cannot uh, do all the parts of palliative care. Much as I am a Christian, I am still growing in my own faith and I might not have answers to all the, the spiritual religious questions. So, but in every palliative care team, you involve uh, religious leaders, pastors, priests, who may be able to answer questions for the patient that I might not be able to have. But to answer your question, how do I marry my profession with my beliefs? I, uh, for me, it's recognizing that there is science and I believe that uh, God works through people. And part of what I do is being a conduit for God to, for me to help people. And that helping people is doing my job as a doctor to the best of my ability and, and involving other doctors, other, other team members. But it's also being honest with people, not, not lying to people. Um, when all of us are going to exit the earth at some point, uh, it's and that's not a reality that we want to face. No, it's not. But it's it is the truth. No one no one comes out of life alive, unfortunately. So even as a Christian, as a doctor, I have to be very honest and and tell people just what is. Briefly, tell me about some of your worst experiences. Uh, my worst and best experience actually was they're the same, and and how I ended up doing this type of work. I was working uh, in Kalingalinga actually and I was faced with a situation where I had a patient who was elderly, they had had a couple of strokes and they were approaching the end of their life. And I knew it, medically I knew that they were approaching the end of their life. 
but I did not know how to, to talk to the family about that. It's not something that I had been particularly trained in. Uh, so I was in this situation where there's a family around and I know that she, she has very little time left and that I, I don't know what to say. And then it happened that one of the family members was a, a palliative care provider themselves and they could see the, the discomfort on my face, I, I guess because they actually put me aside and said, you know, they introduced themselves and they told me what they do and they, they told me that they knew what was happening to their mom. And I had this kind of sense of relief to say, okay, wow, okay, it's kind of been taken away from me. But then they started me on the journey of, they told me about palliative care. So that was one of my lowest points because I didn't know what to do. And then realizing that there is actually help, even for people at the end of their life, was one of the highlights of my career. Have there been situations where someone is under palliative care and then they pull out of that and recover? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's, there are very few absolutes in life. Mm. Um, so our hope is always for recovery, even in palliative care. If there's an opportunity that we think can actually lead to, to a complete recovery, we'll push for it. It's diagnosis, treatment, and follow through. So there have been situations where we start a program with, with, with family members, with a patient, and a new treatment comes, becomes available, and we, we link them to that, and they recover. And we, we celebrate all of those. Okay. How widespread is palliative care in Zambian medical institutions? Unfortunately, not very. Um, there are a few um, hospitals. Uh, I'm at Chilenje. We are trying to set up a palliative care program there. Uh, the Cancer Disease Hospital has a very well-established uh, palliative care program and some of the bigger hospitals have, but generally uh, palliative care is underrepresented in the health sector. It's underrepresented in, in the way we as healthcare workers are trained. We don't really get adequate training about palliative care. Why is that so? I think it's, it's been one of those um, areas where people have been uncomfortable and we've been so focused on, on, on primary care and cure, and then things like palliative care uh, were kind of neglected. They're getting more attention now, and we're looking at palliative care as part of universal health coverage, so that is changing, but it, it needs a lot more work to include palliative care in, in study curriculums or health training institutions. What's the relationship between palliative care and hospice, uh, hospice care? Uh, so it depends on where you are. Uh, in some settings, when we say hospice, it can kind of meet, mean uh, palliative care. In Zambia, for a long time, we, we have hospices, and these were institutions specifically created for people with uh, chronic conditions, terminal conditions, people who needed to stay in these, in these places for a very long time. So hospices, most of them which were faith-based, uh, dealt with palliative care for a long time. So hospice is just one way of providing palliative care. You can do it in a hospice, you can do it in the home, in the home setting, you can do it in a, in a hospital setting. Whose decision is it, Doc, to move a person from convention, conventional care to palliative care? Is it you or the families, much as you would advise? It's, it's always going to be the families. Um, for us as healthcare workers, what we do is advise. We, we, we give information about what we know is happening and what could potentially happen, and then we answer the family's questions, we answer the patient's questions, but the decision finally is the family and particularly the patients. And are there any steps that you follow before you break the news to the family? Yeah, so the first thing is uh, I need to be sure of my diagnosis. So we need to be sure that the patient has been worked up extensively. We don't want to say, oh, you have this when we haven't finished all the, the necessary tests. So we, we make sure that we have fully evaluated the patient. We have done all the necessary tests. If there are treatments that we are supposed to have uh, started, we make sure the patient is on those treatments. And then once we have that, then we sit down and go through the documentation. Uh, not just me, myself as a palliative care provider, but we sit with uh, the other doctors, other healthcare workers that are attending to that patient, and we agree to say this and okay, this is what it is. Um, the most likely, based on science, the most likely outcome is this, and we need to have this discussion with the family. And then at that point, then it's about how do you communicate that information. You have to respect the patient's uh, privacy, you have to respect their autonomy, you're not going to break bad news like that in an open ward, so you want to give them as much privacy, you ask them who they would want to, ha to, to, to be present, 
And then you start by asking them what they know, because I need to know what the patient already knows about their condition, what they think is going to happen, what they would want to happen. And then once we get that, then we fill in the gaps. Is there a correlation between palliative care and, um, and uh, alternative medicine or, or not? Not exactly a correlation, but uh, more of an interrelationship. Um, part of palliative care is uh, using all available resources. And that could be alternative medicines as well. For example, uh, in Uganda, um, they, they found that uh, for, for wounds, there are certain leaves that if you apply the, the crushed um, product of those leaves, they actually help with recovery. So we look at everything that's available, as long as it doesn't harm the patient, we're open to find out what it does, and if we can use it, we do use alternative medicines as well. For example, uh, for stroke patients, people with pain, we use things like acupuncture quite, quite extensively. So that's a, a form of alternative treatment as well. What happens when a person commences a palliative care? Do they stop taking the drugs that would have led them into uh, such a situation? So that decision we make with the rest of the team. So using your example, so if I'm a cancer patient, then I would, would as a palliative team, we would talk with uh, the cancer specialist and say, of all the medicines that my patient is currently taking, if they continue taking these medicines, are there benefits to them continuing these medications? And together we, we, we decide, okay, yes, if the patient needs to continue these medications. And then as the disease progresses, we continue having those discussions because we're only going to want, if someone is approaching the end of their life, for example, not all the medicines are going to be necessary. Some of them might just be increasing the number of pills that you're having to take, increasing your side effects, and if someone is approaching the end of their life, you don't want them to be experiencing all these painful, distressing symptoms. So we discuss what is essential and what can be removed gradually from, from such a patient. And have you had situations where a patient outrightly rejects palliative care? Yes, absolutely. Um, and we respect their decision, we continue talking with them, we continue engaging with the family, but we do not impose or force palliative care approach on anyone. We, we just make people know that we are available. Should they have any questions, they can always come back to us. But yes, people have said no before. What do you tell patients that stop taking the drugs on their own? Because they've come to terms with the fact that nothing is working and next thing is death. We always tell our patients and our families that before they make such a decision, they, they still need to, to, to have a discussion with, with their doctors, with their team. Because much as the, the medications might not cure them, the medications might reduce the amount of suffering that they're going to go through. Uh, your cancer patient example, for example. Um, yes, the cancer might not go away, but I might be on medication specifically for managing my pain. So if I stop taking the pain medication, I will be living with cancer in severe pain right up to the end. So that would not want for anyone. And does a kicking in of palliative care or hospice care signal that you're about to die? Yes, I love that. It's, you're absolutely right. It's not that you, once you hear the word palliative care, it's, oh, I'm about to die. Palliative care, we actually want to begin it right at the point of diagnosis. And we follow, we walk with you all the way, whether that is three months, 10 years, 20 years. So being referred to a palliative care provider does not mean that, oh, I'm about to die. It just means that we're trying to link you to a, a system of care that takes care of you as, a, as an entire person. Not just the disease that you have, cancer, heart failure, but we're interested in everything about you. We're interested about your physical self, we're interested in, in your spiritual well-being, your mental health well-being, so, and, and that we continue throughout. And is uh, palliative care a specialty of medicine? Or? Yes, it is. So it's a specialty of medicine uh, at every level. So you have palliative care nurses, you have palliative care clinical officers, you have palliative care physicians. So it's a specialty. So we all start in one track and then you can decide to specialize specifically in palliative care. You are an advocate of palliative care. And one of the things that you uh, talk about is the lack of um, palliative care in most instances. Is it something that you think should be included in the curriculum for medicine, for everyone to take and at least uh, be able to practice it? Absolutely. Uh, myself, other palliative care providers, 
that is one of the big things that we are pushing for. We've, we've scored a few successes recently as a country. Um, the team that I'm on, we, we developed a palliative care national strategic plan through the ministry. And that includes specifically components about including palliative care in the curriculum of all health training institutions so that in the future, everyone who goes through any health related training is going to get specific training about palliative care. What made you start advocating? Is there anything that piqued your interest? Because I saw people dying in pain, which is not necessary. And um, I saw people living and dying with conditions and, and just dying with questions, not knowing what was going on. And it's really about when my time comes, how do I want my transition to be? So I, I, I practice medicine based on how I would want to be treated at the end of my life. Is it anybody that can practice palliative care or it's just for people that are trained? So everyone, um, we work with family members become palliative care providers themselves, but uh, people need to be trained in necessary communication skills, uh, how to, to prescribe medication. And it can be just because of the nature of, of what we do, it can uh, have a heavy toll. So you need to have a network of support system where you, you, you know you're not alone. So caring for people who are caring for, for other people. So we, we invite people to come, but we need to come and kind of train them a little bit. So what then are the ethics? for palliative care as well as principles, especially for people that are not trained in that area? So it's, it's respecting the patient, it's making sure we're not harming the patient in any way, we're not, we're not doing anything that's going to harm the patient, and it's recognizing that the final decision is the patient's. And this is where you want to start palliative care early, while the person who is ill is able to tell us their thoughts, their wishes, what they do not want to happen to them, what they want to happen to them, instead of uh, the situation that happens a lot now is after the person has died, for example, then people start asking, ah, what, what did they want us to do? Would they want us to, to take them to ICU? Would they want us to take them out of the country when the person is not able to do that? But if we start it early, the person, the patient can tell me, listen, doc, um, I've made a decision, I've understood what's happening to me. I don't want to, to spend all this money traveling to India, to America, I want to go back to my village and see my farm one last time. How affordable are these services and are there any specific institutions in Lusaka, in Zambia where you can get that? So palliative care services are essentially free. In government health facilities, obviously, if you come to the Cancer Disease Hospital, you come to Chilenje, we will offer palliative care as part of standard of care. There are situations where um, a person might need assistance in the home, in which case uh, there are some organizations that are offering uh, home-based care providers, someone to help with the day-to-day. -day. Those may be private institutions and there'll be associated fees. But in the government setting, palliative care is, is part of the free health care that we're all having access to. Based on your experiences, do people that have had palliative care um, or prepared for the end of life end it in a better way compared to those that have not had it and they've not been surrounded by loved ones? In my experience, I, I think so. I think um, being prepared uh, helps the patient uh, transition better. It helps the family because they kind of uh, begin to prepare for what's coming and it's, it doesn't come as a surprise, even when it was not a surprise. And it, it gives people just a chance to, to spend a few last minutes with, with family members. And, and I think, in my experience at least, it's, it's a much better way of doing things. You've been on deathbed before seeing someone die as part of your work. Yeah. What are the most or common words that people utter before they die? And why is that so? That's a difficult question to answer. Um, it's the ones I have been privileged to be at the bedside as they leave. It's usually just words of love and to their families. I think at the end it's about having your family around you. I think the, the, the saddest situations are where people are not able to, to say goodbye. Um, and you can see it on, on the patient's face that they, 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 they would want people around them. 
So when we've had the opportunity to allow family around them, even if they don't say anything with their words, you can see that they're looking around at their family and, and just having your, someone holding your hand, your, your son, your daughter, or your, your brother, sister holding your hand, I think it's a comfort. Are there telltale signs that this person is about to die? Because we've also heard of situations where someone has been ill for a long time, yeah. then they feel better, you, feel, you even think, oh, now they're back. Yeah. And then suddenly, oh, this person is gone. Yeah, it's, there, there are things we look for um, in, in the hospital setting. If someone who's been unwell for some time, they, they, the, the body generally starts to shut down. Um, people start to eat less and less. They become less active. They talk less. Um, they begin to refuse certain things. And right towards the end, you may see things like struggling to breathe. Uh, but it varies. Some people won't even show you anything. And then you just get a phone call in the morning to say, mom died at night. So how do you explain a situation that I've just given you? I mean, you've been ill. You get better, yeah. energetic, and then yeah. suddenly you die. I can't. <laughs> 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 I wish I could, but I can't. There have been situations where I've had sat down with, with families and have had a family conference to say, listen, uh, things are not looking good. And then I, I leave for, for home, clearly expecting not to, to find that the patient survived the night. And I find the patient much brighter the next morning. and. and I've, I've been lost for words. And at a personal level, lastly, uh, you said that uh, the reason you went active on palliative care is because you don't want to be treated uh, in the manner that other people that have not gone through palliative care have been treated as they're about to die. Yeah. The day that you will die, or shortly before you die, how would you want to be treated? I would want to not be in pain. I would want to have my family around me. Um, I think I would want to die at home as well, in, in an environment that is familiar to me, instead of... Uh, the hospital environment can be very intimidating sometimes, so I think to be free of pain, to be surrounded by family members in, a, in an environment that is familiar to me, I think would be the way I'd want to go. And your last words would be, as you are dying? Uh, oof. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to, I, I, my, my family and friends know I would probably say something very silly, but I would just... <laughs> well, what's that silly? <laughs> uh, something like, uh, it's been fine, fun knowing all of you. I told you I was dying. <laughs> <laughs> on that silly note, Doc, thank you very much for appearing on Studio Ken. And I know I don't mean silly in the literal <laughs> meaning. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Ken. Pleasure. Super fantastic videos, fire in the wire, BBDB flow, your desire taking you higher and higher. My name is BBDB flow. You're now rocking with Studio Ken. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Chances are.